Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Let me turn this thing off here. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Romans 10 and 8, it says, But what say is it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith we preach. Hallelujah. So tonight we're going to declare the word of God. We've been discussing for the last several weeks about spiritual warfare, strongholds, bondages, and how to be set free from it. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited tonight what God is doing in our midst tonight. Truly, he's great, and he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Good evening, Shonda. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. It says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, my soul have no pleasure in him. So these lessons that we have been discussing for quite a while now are messages to help us in our faith to grow to be committed to the cause of Christ and that we would not draw back into the things of the world through the desires of our flesh that causes us to turn away from the Lord. But tonight, the Lord is reassuring us that when we put our confidence in him, trust in him, stand on his word, he will keep us steadfast in the faith doesn't matter what the enemy brings against you, presents to you, we still have the victory in Christ Jesus to overcome every obstacle, every trial, every test, because we have the greater one living inside of us, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. We're going to start in just a minute. Get into the word. But I'm going to open up tonight. Hey, God bless you, Desiree. Praise the Lord. I'm going to read a devotion today. And it's in Mark. It's uh, for March 9th. It says, God... Today and throughout my life, I'm going to put a praise on every situation, good or bad. I will not live by fear. It is only a demon. I will live by faith. Lord, I know the giants I'm facing today are little ants to you, Father. I will stay focused on who and as well as what matters. Praising you, Lord, all the days of my life definitely is most important to me. Lord, I will stay in constant communication with you through prayer. Prayer is one of the most powerful tools you have given me. 
Thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. I'm praying to have more of you, God. Hallelujah. You know, that's a wonderful devotion today because every situation that we encounter is only a test. It's a challenge of your faith to see where is your dependency. Are you trusting and relying on God? Are you trusting your own ability to overcome the enemy by yourself? But the Lord, in the Lord's eyes, the, the enemy, when he comes to attack you, these are little bitty things to him. But to us, it looks like giants surrounding us. But the Sarah says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battle. We fight our battles by recognizing that God is surrounding us with his presence. And because he is the great I am, the enemy has no choice but to surrender when he speaks. When God speaks with authority, the enemy is nothing in his presence. And that's the same way it is to us in our lives today. When we allow God to speak through us, the enemy becomes nothing. He becomes minute. He becomes inadequate in our lives because of the greater one who lives inside of us. So we got to stay focused. All the days of our lives, we got to put a praise on it. Just keep on putting a praise on the good and the bad times of your life. Put a praise on it. Because it said we will not live by fear, but we live by faith. So the just should live by faith. And when we know that the faith that we have is not our faith, it's a faith, the God kind of faith that God has given us through his word. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you tonight, oh God, we thank you for another opportunity, oh God, to get into your word. I pray, God, that you speak by divine revelation from the oracles of God's word, Father God, that will inspire, edify, and build us up in our faith to trust you. That you allow us to hear your voice, obey your voice, and follow after your command to cast down every imagination and every high thought that comes against the knowledge of God and bringing those thoughts into imprisonment to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has conquered all of our foes and gave us a victory. And I thank you, Lord God, that strongholds are being broken. Demons are fleeing at the name of Jesus. Sicknesses is being healed in the name of Jesus. Dead are being raised to life at the name of Jesus. The blinded eyes are, are being opened to see at the name of Jesus. And the deaf ears are hearing your praise, God, and begin to open their mouth. The dumb begin to sing praise unto the Most High God. I thank you, Lord God, that you are God and God all by yourself. And I ask tonight, God, that you speak to us by your spirit that would draw our attention that will bring us to a place of surrenderance as we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, that you will lift us up in due season. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you for joining tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I expect God to speak tonight a word that will help change my life. God bless you, Victor. Thank you for joining tonight. I expect God to speak a word that will inspire us, that will build us up in our faith to grow stronger in our walk with the Lord. We all have weaknesses. I was talking to a person earlier today who, who's been struggling with a certain addiction. And the Lord reminded me that many times when people approach us and we're supposed to be quote unquote Calls a call, called born again believers, children of the most high God, ministers of God, we turn them away because they come more than one time to you with the same issue, the same problem. We're quick to turn them away. But the Lord reminded me, he says, every time you fell off and got back into your addiction, whatever it is, I never turned you away. I embrace you in my love. And I reminded her of the story in Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son. How the prodigal son came to his father and, and wanted, he wanted his inheritance early. Inheritance is not given. If you know history, 
Inheritance is not given to a person who's alive. It's given to a person who's dead. And so the inheritance he wanted was his portion of the money that he's going to get when his father passed away. He took this money, went out, the Bible says, and lived a riotous life, a party life, a wild life. He went out into the world to satisfy the pleasures of his flesh until all his friends were gone, his money was gone. Then he had nobody else to turn to. So he went to a person who had some, some pigs and asked him, can he, can he hire them on to, to feed the pigs? He wasn't even allowed to eat the husk that the pigs could eat. That's how poor he became to where nothing was able to satisfy him until he came to him senses, to himself, and said, you know what? Let me tell my father this. I'm going to go back home. I make my mind up. I'm going to go back home to my father. I'm going to tell my father, I'm not worthy to be called your child anymore. Not worthy to be your son anymore. Just make me like one of your hired servants and I'll serve you. And I'm not even worthy of anything you have for me. But the Bible goes on to talk about the prodigal son. When he ran to go back home. His father had been seeking daily, looking for him. And when he saw his son coming, the father ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him on his neck. Then he told his servants, bring me the best ring, which restored his covenant back with his father. Then he said, bring me the best robe, which restored his, his deity, his authority, back in position as a sonship. And then he said, and put... Put, put, you know, begin to throw a feast for him, a celebration, because he that was lost is now found. That's how God does us. He doesn't throw us away every time we make a mistake. He throws a celebration. In Luke chapter 15, when you get a chance, read the whole chapter. You're going to find out in that chapter, Jesus was telling parables about people who lost something valuable to themselves. And when they found it, there was a great celebration. God says the same thing about us. When we're lost and we drift off from the faith to go back to the things that entices our flesh. The reason why we've been dealing with strongholds for the last several months almost a year now, is because God wants us to wake up. Pay attention. These things are demonic activities that attach itself to your mindset and gets into your heart to destroy you. And you got to recognize this spirit when it comes and get back into the right place and right standing and right relationship with God. And allow God to cleanse you and purify your thoughts and your actions. And I guarantee when you do that, God receive you as if you never left him before. That's the kind of God we serve. So as we've been talking about the spirit of death, the spirit of bondage, the spirit of wickedness, spirit of witchcraft, all these different things we talked about. And God is saying to us believers tonight that it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what came against you. He had a remedy and he still has the same remedy today. For every born again believer. That when you're dealing with. The spirit of divination. This familiar spirits. <coughs> excuse me. Spirit of jealousy. Lying spirits. Perverse spirits. Haughty spirits. Prideful spirits. Heaviness. The spirit of whoredom. The spirit of infirmity. The spirit of deaf and dumb. The spirit of bondage. The spirit of fear, seducing spirits, the spirit of antichrist, the spirit of error, and the spirit of death. God is reminding us that these things are common to mankind. This is nothing that takes us off course. It's nothing that we shouldn't be surprised about because these are the attributes of the enemy. But when you recognize that the enemy... It's behind these different spirits. You got to get to the place of seeking God's face. Get back to the place of recognizing that God is in control of your life and tell the Lord about your problem. Many of us deal with these different spirits in one way or another. Doesn't matter what your bondage is. 
It can be uh, loving your car more than you love God. It can be loving your possessions more than you love God. It can, it can be haughtiness, pridefulness. It doesn't matter what it is. The spirit behind that spirit is the enemy that's using those things to destroy your entire life. That's right, demonic activity. These are demonic activities that when you leave a breach in your heart, in your mind, in your eye gate, in your ear gate, when you leave a breach, and what I mean by breach is an access point where the enemy can come in and out of your life as he chooses, God called those breaches. And when God had one of the men of God named Nehemiah to repair a wall that has been torn down that protected a city, God had him speak and get to go to the king and find favor with the king in order to get the materials to rebuild this wall. And then, he's, then he found out after building the wall, there were some breaches. And God told him, seal the breach. When you seal the breach, you're cutting off the pathway, the access point of the enemy that would like to come into your life as he chooses to destroy you. And God says, as you stand on the word of truth, the word of truth will begin to show you the access points that have been left open by the enemy and begin to show you how the enemy has been using these things, places in your life that you gave him access to, to plant baits. He plants baits in your life. And what I mean by baits, he plant things that he know that you, you desire, the things that are enticing, the things that you love to do that's not of God. So he set these traps for you to draw you to that place where you are now vulnerable for his access to come into your life and control you. Once he takes control, then he can lead you down the pathway the Bible calls destruction. So we got to recognize these spirits. God bless you, Pastor Cornell. We got to recognize the spirit of the enemy when he presents himself to you, how to know his devices and his tactics through the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee when we get to the place where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of being attacked with the same old temptation, the same old devices the enemy used against us every season, every so often, the same thing happens in your life. I, I know one time it was like I had a season in my life, I would get depressed. Every year, it was around the same month and the same time of the month, I found myself getting depressed. And when God began to show me that was a breach from something that happened years before out of childhood, he said, if you don't seal that breach in that area, that same spirit is going to continue to influence you in the same season. We got to identify these seasons. When they come, what happens to you? What changes your thinking? What attitude you have? If it's your hair, I know people that get, get these weaves in their hair. They don't realize these weaves they put in their hair, many of them haven't prayed over by witch doctors. If you don't believe it, look it up. Look it up on Google. It'll tell you. The, the enemy uses the witch doctors in Africa to pray over this stuff that people use to attach to their hair. And you're releasing spirits into your own self through the avenue of weave. And people don't believe that. But it's true. I know somebody that every time they change their weave, their attitude change. And I watched the pattern for years. And it was the same thing at the same season every year in the same month, around the same time. Their attitude would change and become negative. And when God, I began to pray and ask God, so what is it? Why is this person acting like this every year around the same time. He said, because it's a spirit that's been released into them that they haven't dominated. The spirit dominates them every year around the same time. You hear what I just said? The spirit of the enemy would dominate you around the same time, same cycle, the same thing you do. He'll bring you right back around full circle to repeat itself with the same things that's going to lure you into temptation. Galatians chapter 5. It's been our key scripture through all these lessons, all 16 lessons that we discuss. The same spirit that's behind these things are the attributes of the works of the flesh. 
And it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, which is a filthiness, a wantonness, and it says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variances, the spirits, the conjuring spirits, witchcraft, immolations, wrath, seditions, and heresies, envy and murder, and drunkenness, and rebellion, that's brawling, fighting, and such like of which I tell you and before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All these attributes are listed here are the baits that Satan uses in a born-again believer's life to entice you, to lure you away from the truth of God's word. Because the enemy doesn't want you to be committed, faithful, a steward, to the word of God, a servant of the most high God, a child of God, being, being faithful in your dealings with God's word, doing the work of the kingdom. He doesn't want you doing none of that. So tonight we want to discuss additional advice for spiritual warfare, which is the end of the book, The Strong Man, His Name, What's His Game? We've come to the end of the book, and I found this very interesting, the additional advice that's mentioned in this book. So we're going to go through this tonight and then we'll be done with this book. And then next week we'll be starting the book, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Battlefield of the Mind. The Thank you, Holy Ghost. The Battlefield of the Mind. So we'll be starting the Battlefield of the Mind next week by Joyce Myers. It's a very powerful book. If you don't have it in your library, get that book in your library. Because I guarantee that book will help change your thinking. If you're dealing with a habit, addiction, a problem, a stronghold, a lie from the devil in your life, I guarantee you get this book, The Battlefield of the Strong Mind, it's going to wake up your spirit. And it's going to wake up your vision to begin to see what God sees, your ears to hear what God hears, and your mouth going to start speaking what God commands you to speak and not what the enemy has been using you to speak for your life. So I guarantee God has something for you in that book. Other scriptures related to this is Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. If you're taking notes, that's another scripture. God bless you, nephew. Good to see you tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, and Revelation 21, chapter verse 8. It says, Whatever the works of the flesh are practiced, there will usually be a strong man present. Because that is the area of operation. Whether the works of the flesh get beyond that stage into demonic activity depends on the individual involved. That is a very profound, profound statement. Wherever the works of the flesh are practiced, it's up to you how it's going to operate in your life. You have the power of death and life in the power of your tongue. So whatever you speak, whatever you allow to come into your, your mindset and your heart is going to go through your ear gate and you're going to begin to manifest those things through your life because this is a strong man from, from the enemy using to destroy you. Demonic activity. So demonic activity is a weapon that the enemy uses against you to stop you, to enable you, even to bring you to a place of, of idleness where you would become inactive to neutralize you, to stop you from doing anything for God. Minister of God, child of God, born again believer, the enemy wants to neutralize you tonight. All these lessons that we discuss are, are instruments the enemy wants to use 
to neutralize you. And if you allow him to have access into your life and through your mindset, through your attitude, through your mouth, through your ears, the enemy will come in and take total control of your destiny. He'll pervert the plan of God for your life to stop you from getting into the place God has for you. But if he ignores the conviction of the Holy Spirit, let me go a little further. Here, here's something else. It said many times the first stages of the works of the flesh is curiosity. That is so true. Things we've never done before. Let one of your friends come around doing something you've never done before, and they keep enticing you. You keep hanging around them. They keep luring you. They can all oh, come on, just do a little bit of weed. Come on, let's do a little alcohol. Go, go on and get sleep with that person. God, God knows your heart. It, it ain't going to hurt you. If, if you repent, God's going to forgive you. People are going to tell you that. Your own conviction of your heart, God bless you, sister. Your only conviction of your heart comes from the Holy Spirit, which warning signs to let you know you're about to tread on dangerous grounds. But a lot of times, we ignore that voice, that still small voice. When God spoke to Elijah when he was hiding in the cave from Jezebel, he was hiding. And God sent the whirlwind, he sent the earthquake, he sent the storm, he sent the rain, sent the wind. God wasn't in none of that activity. He was in a still, small voice speaking to Elijah to encourage him. But a lot of times, that still, small voice is your conscience that's leading you in righteousness. I remember watching Flintstones years ago. And when Fred Flintstone was about to engage in something he shouldn't have do that he didn't want his wife to know, there was two little, little people who were standing on the shoulder. One was an angel and one was a devil. And the devil said, you can go on and do that. Your wife ain't going to know what you're doing. You can go on and gamble. You can go on and give, give that woman over there. It, it, it doesn't matter. She ain't going to know what you're doing. And the conscience of the, of, the, of the angel will say, no, don't do that. Fred, that's going to hurt you. They're going to stop you. They're going to destroy you. And many times, that's what God does to us. We have the Holy Spirit on one side. We have the enemy on the other side speaking to us, giving us direction. And which voice you ever heed to is the voice that's going to dominate you. And many times, we do just what the enemy wants us to do out of curiosity. Curiosity, they say, kill the cat. But satisfaction brought them back. And that's a lie from the enemy. Because once you destroy yourself, only God can bring you back. You can't bring yourself back from the things that you use to destroy yourself. Only God has the power to cause life and death to come forth in your life. So then it goes on and says, which leads to the initial participation. Your curiosity will lead you to participate in an ungodly activity that you know God is not approved of, God is not pleased with, God doesn't love. So you allow yourself to fall into the trap being led by the bait of the enemy. I remember being in pest control. And at the trap, one time I had to trap a, 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 a skunk. And I remember I had to set a bait in order to draw the skunk. So whatever I put down that would draw the skunk's attention, the, the skunk would smell it. Now as he began to smell it, it began to draw him closer and closer to the trap I had set for him. And so eventually he got close enough to get into the trap. And when he walked into the trap, I closed the gate and got him. The enemy does the same thing to you, my child, my brother and sister in Christ. He sets the baits before you, and he has a trap at the end of that bait. And he knows that at the end of that bait, if I can trap you, well, you have no way to escape, I got you. But God says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, he said, there is no temptation taking you, but such that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you will be able to what? To bear it. In other words, to overcome it. But the problem comes in some things we don't want to overcome because we got comfortable. 
We got satisfied with the stronghold in our lives. We're comfortable doing wrong before God, even though God is convicting you. We get to the place where our conscience becomes seared with sin to where God's conviction don't even do no harm to us no more. His convicting power has no more influence over you. That's when your conscience is being seared with sin and then you become a reprobate of mind. When you're wrong now has become right and the right that God to you do has become wrong. Read in chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. Read that whole chapter, Romans chapter 1. It talks about that. And when you get to the place where your conscience has become seared with sin and you become a reprobate, your destiny is a lake of fire. Hell. That's where you're going to go when you die. But then it goes on and says, wherever the works of the flesh are practiced, they will usually be strong in the present. And it said, because that is the area of operation. That is the area of their operation. It's the area where you allow the strong man, where you, in, you entwine yourself with the strong man. You play with the strong man until he got you trapped. Whether the work of the flesh get beyond the stage of the normal activity, it depends on the individual. So you have to make a choice. But then he goes on in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. So whoso breaketh and hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Well, what it's talking about, and this is wisdom. Ecclesiastes talks about having wisdom. And this is Solomon talking to the people to remind us that God has a hedge around you. But when you get from behind that hedge, that protection that God has placed on your life, the serpent bites you. I'm reminded of the story when Moses was in the wilderness with the children of Israel and they were being bitten with serpents because of their rebellion. God allowed a plague of serpents to come and attack them because they kept rebelling and reverting to idol worship. So when God told him to make a pole with a bronze servant on it and lift it up. So God had uh, Ben and her, Moses' assistants, to come along to hold his arms up, to keep holding this brazen serpent up in the air. And he said, whoever look upon that serpent, they will be healed. So even though you got bit, God says, I have a remedy even for when you get bit by the serpent. So he told Moses, keep that bronze serpent lifted up until I allow this plague to pass them by. And, and Moses did just what God instructed him. We do the same thing today. We get out of the will of God, and God allows the enemy to bite you. So the enemy comes and begin to poison you with the, his devices, his, his characteristics, his identity, his DNA. He poisons you, and then now you're entrapped and don't know what to do. How many times have God warned you about doing something you shouldn't do and you did it anyway? It costs you. Sin will cost you. Rebellion will cost you. Stubbornness will cost you. Idol worship will cost you. Because God is not playing with us, church. He's given us warning after warning after warning to get our lives lined up with the word of God to get back on track. And if you don't heed the voice of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find yourself walking to the pathway of destruction. This had to do with a special kind of hedge that was planted around the house to keep the dangerous snakes from coming into on the premises. If a break or an opening was allowed in the hedge, the possibilities of a snake getting in were, were in high. If a snake's if snakes were common in the area, it would happen sooner than if the house were not located in snake country. So as this hedge was around to protect you, what it's saying here, that if you allow yourself to have a breach in your hedge, the enemy will bring his serpents to come in your hedge to bite you. And it says, in other words, if we leave an open door in our spiritual hedges, the possibilities are high that we will be bitten. If, keyword, if we leave a possibility for the enemy to come into your life, it's a guarantee that you're going to be bitten. But if we keep our defenses or our heads solid, we can live in this snake-filled world and never be touched by the evil tactics of the enemy. 
only ministry, ministry of the word of God by the Holy Spirit can keep us free from sin. Only the ministry by the Holy Spirit and the word of God through the word of God can keep us from sin. If we avoid the word on a daily basis, we shut off the alarm system, allowing the door to crack open so Satan can take a shot at us and we find ourselves in a battle that we could have avoided. If we don't use discernment and keep our defenses up and stay on guard and stay alert, we leave the gateway open, a breach in your house where the enemy can slither his way in to your life. And the alarm would not sound. Many of us have alarms on our houses. And the alarm is to keep intruders out and protect you on the inside. So if anyone did break into your house, the alarm would sound to alert the police system. And the police would respond to your, 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 your house or your habitation because there was a breach in your perimeter. God does the same thing with a child of God. The alarm system of the Holy Spirit will sound when there's an intruder in your life. I love this point. When the intruder breaks in unannounced into your house, your spiritual house, God says the Holy Spirit will begin to sound the word of God in your ear. Get back to prayer. Get back to consecration. Get back to seeking God's faith because there's a breach in your perimeter. And when you get back to the place of seeking God's face, then everything the enemy tries to do is stopped. It's blocked by the word of God. But the problem comes in. We know it and we still don't do nothing about it. Here's some additional advice to help in your spiritual warfare. Use discernment. Use discernment. Not every problem in our spiritual lives it's caused by a demon. I love this point. Many times the problem begins when we step out of line with God's word. You hear what I just said? Many times we blame the enemy for something that we've done. We blame the enemy for some breaches we're allowed in our lives that we've done. But we want to blame the enemy. And God says tonight that you can't blame the enemy for being out of the will of God. If you're out of the will of God, you need to get back on track. That's the key word. Get back on track. Because without God's word, you left defenseless. Only God's word can stop the enemy in his track from violating your house. Then sometimes, here's another vital point. Quietly take dominion. Quietly take dominion. There are people that we've been praying for, believing God for deliverance for, believing God for healing, believing God to change their lives. And sometimes the more you verbalize it, they get irritated. They don't want to hear you keep talking about the same thing because they're sick or they're in, a, in a trouble or in a problem that they put themselves in and, and they know God can do it but they're not ready to be delivered yet. So sometimes you got to go into your secret closet. And when you get into your secret closet, the Bible says when you pray in secret, your father will reward you openly. That's the kind of God we serve. Just quietly continue taking dominion over the situation in the name of Jesus, either within your own spirit or an audible, audibly when you are alone until such time of the individual or the Holy Spirit has indicated that he's ready to listen. You can't choke somebody with the word of God. If they're not ready to be delivered, you can't force the word of God down their throat to make them listen to you because you got the remedy for them. You got to get to the place where you say, okay, God, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Leave me on exactly what to do how to do it, what to say, when to say, that this person will hear your voice speaking through me and receive it. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit will let you know they're ready or they're not ready to receive the word of God. 
The only exception to this rule would be a clear case of possession in which the Holy Spirit leads you to take direct action and cast it out. The same way Jesus was. Jesus did not talk to demons. And allow, my, my, Jesus did not allow demons to talk to him. He spoke to the demons. That's what I'm trying to say. He spoke to the demons and told them to be quiet. And he commanded them to come out. There are times where you feel the unction of the Holy Spirit inside of you with an authority. When you know a person has been influenced and been held in captivity by demonic, bond, demonic bondage, God can tell you now is the time to take authority. And you can tell the demon, I command you to come out of them, that person, whoever it may be, in the name of Jesus, and loose them and let them go. Guess what happens? The enemy will respond to the word of God because you took authority in the name of Jesus. And I guarantee when you call on that great name, the demons will flee and lose that person and let them go. Then you must be careful to make sure this person is filled with the word of God and the Holy Spirit after the demonic spirit leaves them. So they cannot return back to their place of residency. I remember I read a scripture back in Luke. I forgot which chapter it is, but I think it's 15. Not 15. Um, I'll find it later on. But how it's talking about when a demon leaves a person's life, he goes and searches to find more demons. And he comes back and says, you know what? Let me return back to my house. So he goes back to his house. And he, command, he says, you know what? I'm going to go back to my house where I, I have had possession at. And I'm going to take authority because, you know, they ain't doing nothing, putting nothing in, my, in place that I left. So I can come back home. So Luke chapter uh, 11, verse 22, it says, But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, overcome him, takes him, he said, all his possessions, where he trusted, he, you know, is divided the spoils. But it says, when the unclean spirit, verse 24, Luke chapter 11, verse 24, it says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. In other words, a place where there's no substance. Dry places seeking rest. The demons are looking for another house when you cast them out to call his home. But if he does it, then it goes and says, and he finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house once I come. So the demons take ownership of you. If you give them ownership, the demons got control of your entire life. And there's nothing you can do outside of that, of your own will, because he got you. Until you get back to the place of giving your will into the hand of God and allowing God to take control of your will. Then God can lead you into victory and overcome that spirit. Do not be overcome so by demon consciousness that you forget the far greater truth that your name is written down in heaven. So Luke chapter 10 verse 20 said, so do not be overcome by demon consciousness so you forget that you that the truth that your name is written in heaven. Then he said, be aware of your spiritual power as you act in the name of Jesus, but emphasize the positive as much as positive. God saves, God heals, God baptizes in the Holy Spirit, and he does all through truly great things in the world. Grow in the word of, of grow in the word so the fruit of the spirit can flourish in your life. So what it's saying here. Be aware of the spiritual power that you have in your possession and recognize that you must be positive in using this power because the power that God has, God can save, God can heal, God can deliver, God can baptize that person, the Holy Spirit, and the truth, God can change the entire world. Then it says, grow in the word so that the fruit of the spirit can flourish in your life and the gifts of the spirit can operate through you as well. So you got to get in the word. Here's another point. Give God the glory. Always take time to give God the glory publicly for everything 
that is accomplished of the positive nature. Never touch the glory for yourself. It belongs to God. There's a very vital point in your Christian walk. If God used you to do something extraordinary, to help somebody and save their life, change their life, to raise them from the dead, give God the glory. Don't take the glory for yourself as if you operate in your own ability, but allow God to get the glory for what he's done through you. Then your prayer language. Use your prayer language. Your spiritual prayer language is a powerful weapon against the enemy because the Holy Spirit says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings or intercessions that, that, you know, that we can't even pray or utter our own mouths. But then in an the audible voice, we got to continue to do as Matthew 18, 18 says. It helps to bind and loose the enemy, his attributes, his characteristics, his nature in the lives of people and set them free by loosening the power of the Holy Spirit to take residency in their hearts and deliver them and set them free and to fill them with his presence that they no longer go backwards to the things they've been delivered from. That is why it's a good habit to speak the word of God no matter how you feel or think. You hear what I just said? It is very vital to your spiritual health to speak the word of God Every day over yourself, whether you feel like it or you don't. Only God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and all-powerful. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's everywhere at the same time. And you got to recognize that God is at work in your life to will and do according to his good pleasure. So you got to be able to use your voice. I said on our men's prayer line every Sunday, we have prayer. The men want to clam up and not open their mouths. I said, God called us men of authority. We call our prayer line men of integrity. I said, where is the integrity when we don't open our mouths to pray when we need to pray? God gave you a voice. If God gave you a voice, then you have to use that voice for his glory to pray to help somebody else who might be struggling on this prayer line. The same way here in these lessons, you use your voice. Allow the Spirit of God to give you a holy boldness to stand up against unrighteousness and decree righteousness in the lives of the people that you meet. An angel of light. Remember, Satan appeared as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 through 15 talks about this. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preach unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. If anyone come to you preaching heresies, other belief systems turning you from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let him be accursed. In other words, you're releasing the condemnation and judgment of God to follow an individual. You don't have to fight your enemies anymore. God fought the enemy. You claim the victory over your enemy. And when you claim the victory that's already been won, the Lord himself said, I will fight for you because he said, vengeance is mine. Says the Lord, I will repay. If God promised to avenge you of your adversary, then why are we fighting our, our, our enemies with our mouths? Be careful, little tongue, what you say. Because our tongues is a little member, but yet can do great damage in, in lives of people. And you have to be careful what you allow to come out of your mouth. Then it says, stay humble. We're not to be filled with pride. Because we are used by the Holy Spirit to help set people free from the enemy's attack. you got to stay humble. Any believer, according to Mark 16, chapter, verse 17, should be able to take dominion over demons in the name of Jesus. And that's the scripture that talks about we've been given authority over scorpions and serpents, and over all the powers of the enemy. If you drink any deadly poison, it won't hurt you. 
That's the power we have. Christ has given us. Then it says we should be more comfortable with the knowledge of God's word so that we're able to conquer our worrying and our fears the enemy brings to us. There's no need to fear. It is an important fact that Jesus rules and reigns in our lives. It is very important that we recognize and be reminded that Jesus rules and reigns in our lives. Because of our relationship with him, we have power. Use your power. Use your weapons. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 and 10. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power is might. But then it goes on talking about put on the full armor of God. That you are able to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So put on the full armor. And then it goes on to say, no need to fear. There is no need to fear that demons will reach out and grab us as we pray for people. Luke 10, 19, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to trade on service goes over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall hurt you. And he says, you know, he says, then he goes on talking about if you drink any daily point, it will not harm you. But, you know, because he said, you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. All those different things he promises us that we have through this authority. Then he says, the demons are the ones who fear us because we are God's children. You hear what I just said? Demons ought to be fearing you. Demons should fear you every day when you get up out of your bed. Because they should say, uh-oh, the child of God is up again. Let me get out the way. I can't touch this one today because they're covered in the blood of Jesus. They should with the presence of the Lord. The demons should fear you and leave you alone. Because when you rise up, you rise up in the Lord Jesus Christ. James told us that demons tremble because they know what the situation really is. James chapter 2, verse 19. He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. The word flee in the Greek, its translation means to run from something or someone in terror. So when you get up in the morning, the enemy should recognize who you are and whose you are and run in terror to get away from you. Demons are terrified. When you rise up in your authority, they're terrified when you rise up in your identity. They're terrified when you rise up in your purpose. And when you walk in the plan God has for your life, the demons run from you. The only expectation to this would be a bystander who is not a believer or someone who is in unsure of his position for God. For this reason, we command that in the spiritual warfare, only be filled believers who understand that they have overcome in the name of Jesus, be present. So if you're not a born-again believer or you are a believer, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, it, it, what it's saying here, you can't cause no demons to flee because you, you don't have the power. You don't know your authority. Until you've been properly trained to how to cast out demons, the demons are not going to flee. And the way you learn this is through reading God's word. The more you get the word in you, the more the Holy Spirit activates the word. He changed your thinking. He caused you to get your spiritual muscles. He builds you up on the inside as you're praying in the Holy Ghost, in your spiritual language. He's praying to God, giving God what he wants, his praise, his due diligence. Then the Spirit begins to fill you up with refreshness of the Holy Spirit. Then walk by faith. Do not wait for physical com confirmation to prove that something has happened. Nothing may happen on the surface. But a great spiritual process has been set in motion the moment we utter God's word in faith. The moment we utter God's word in faith, something happens spiritually in the lives of individuals. You may never see it with your natural eye at that moment until maybe years later or months later or days later. The victory is ours. Jesus is Lord. He conquered the enemy and he leads them in victory. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, it died immediately, but from the roots up. It took some time for the results to surface. We walk by faith and not by sight. Mark 11, chapter verse 22 to 26. Read that. Mark 11, chapter verse 20, 20 to 26. And I guarantee it's going to talk to you about faith. Then use your authority. Use your authority. Speak to the enemy 
and a normal voice of authority. It isn't necessary to scream unless you're sure the person is of the word of God. Many times the loudest shouts as though they were trying to frighten the devil with a loud voice. If the spirit of God tells you to, to yell at an individual to cast out the spirit in your authority, then you speak loud. But if he tells you to speak in an audible voice, in a calm voice, a normal voice, then you speak by the unction of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that frightens the enemy is Jesus Christ. The only thing that frightens the enemy is Jesus Christ. The facts of life. Spiritual warfare is not an elective. It is a fact of life. It's not a choice. It's a fact of life. Spiritual warfare. Some Christians erroneously, erroneously believe that the moment a person accepts Christ, he will never have to deal with demonic attacks again because Jesus defeated Satan when he died and rose from the dead. If that were true, then why did Paul tell Timothy to fight the good fight of faith? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Paul also said, put on the full armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of this darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness high places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. He says we wrestle, and then he lists the power we have at our disposal to win in the wrestling match. We have truth, we have righteousness, the gospel of peace, we have faith, we have salvation, we have the word of God, and, the, and praying in the spirit. These are the power we have at our disposal to use against the enemy. When we were saved, Jesus died on the cross. But it said, but we were still to work out our own salvation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. We have to work out our soul's salvation. So there is a daily part to salvation that we are responsible for maintaining. There is a daily responsibility for you to do to maintain your salvation. And that's by studying the word of God, getting the word in your spirit, and keep on walking in the word and standing on the word. We are victorious. We're almost done. We're almost done. So, one more point is that we are victors. One thing we can agree on, that Jesus gave us the victory over the power of the enemy. And whatever his form or tech may be, we have the victory. So you have the victory, my brother, my sister. Keep standing on the word of God and then begin to bind and loose the enemy. And, and as the word says, cast them down. Loose its activity from your life and loose the power of the Holy Spirit to come into your life, to change your life. No one doubts that Jesus was talking about spiritual warfare in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. When he said, how can one enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? Then he, would, then he said, then he would spoil his house. The word bind in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29 is the same Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew 16, verse 19 and Matthew 18, 18. When he says, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So it's the same thing telling you that whatever you identify that's binding an individual, a binding yourself, the word deo, whatever you find that has an entrapment on anybody's life, you have the power. The second word is whatsoever. In the Greek is ho, which is a neuter singular in Matthew 16, 19 in Hosea which is a new to plural in Matthew 18, 18, reading of Matthew 19, uh, 16, verse 19, which is identical. It says, whatsoever, not masculine or feminine, feminine and gender, ye shall bind, is not masculine or feminine and gender, on earth shall be bound in heaven. So it's whoever that operates, that's bound up by the enemy or influenced by the enemy, we have the power to overcome it through the power of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. And we must be reminded that God is always greater. He is the greater one who's living inside of us. He is the greater force that works through us. He overcomes the enemy in our lives every time we recognize I can't do anything without Christ in my life. So then we got the last point, 
Continue to grow spiritually. Continue to grow spiritually. After identifying and recognize what things it was that had you in captivity, you have been set free. Now we must walk and maintain our freedom by studying God's word, seeking God's face, consecrating ourselves, trusting God in his word, having the God kind of faith. And the more you recognize that without God, I can do nothing. Paul puts it this way. We are to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Keep on pressing because God has a crown and rewards waiting for those who faithfully accomplish his will in their lives. The greater one lives within us. So Jesus puts it this way. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. It says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of this world. So my brother, my sister, stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Allow the power of the word of God to transform your thinking, to change your entire life, to walk in the path of truth and righteousness on a daily basis. Make it the priority, the number one priority in your life that when you get up in the morning to put God first before you go make your coffee, before you go, go do anything else, you wake up in the morning, give God thanks for another day. He allows you to get up before you do anything else. I guarantee it has set your day in motion. I find it in my life every day. The more I give God acclimates, when I get up in the morning, everything falls in line for that day what God has for me. It's the same thing that happened to you. So if you're on this line tonight and you don't know Jesus or your Lord and Savior, or you might be a backslider, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, that I am a backslider, and I ask you to forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Now fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a free life, to live a fruitful life, an abundant life, as you allow the Holy Spirit to fill my heart with your power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. I guarantee that the Holy Spirit on the inside is going to begin to resonate and remind you of this word tonight. The lesson we have been studying these last several months, he's going to remind you. And he's going to begin to show you the plan God has for your life. And I guarantee you're going to receive the benefit of it. As every week we do, if you desire to sow a seed into the ministry, I'm going to post it right now here in the link. Desire to, to sow a seed into the ministry. It goes right back into the ministry for the materials and different things God wants to do in our ministry. And I guarantee you sow your seed. God will bless you. He will restore unto you. A hundredfold blessing plus. But you got to have an expectancy. Don't just sow a seed because I'm asking you to sow a seed. But sow a seed in expectancy. Expecting God to bless you tremendously. That you will receive an overflow. Checks in the mail. That happens to me many times. I pray and sow a seed. And I pray over that seed. I believe God for something. And something always comes unexpectedly in a way I never expected it but it be what I expected God to do to bless me. And blessings come in many forms. It can be a blessing of a kind word. It can be a blessing of meeting your need. It can be a blessing of blessing somebody else. God knows just what you need when you need it, when you walk in obedience. So Father, tonight I thank you for this word. I pray your word, Father God, has not fallen upon deaf ears, that you convict all of our hearts to righteousness. If there's areas in our lives, oh God, that we know about, 
Father, show us, convict us, bring us to a place where we fall on our faces before you in repentance and allow the Holy Spirit to wash our consciousness, to clean our hearts, to purge it with hyssop, to wash us in the blood, that we can be clean, O oh God, from iniquity and sin. And then, Lord, come into our hearts and restore us and revive us and refresh us and fill us with your presence like never before. I thank you. Now, Holy Spirit, fill us up right now with your power that we would get off this line tonight and become more of a steward of the word of God, to study the word of God, to meditate on the word of God, to speak the word of God over our family, over our businesses, over our children, over our homes, over our churches, over our community, over our president, over our government officials. We speak the word in the atmosphere by faith, believing that the word of God will manifest and bring a change in the lives of the hearers of this word. And those who didn't hear this word will hear this word by the faith in the spirit. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you again for tuning in. God bless you, sis. I see you on tonight. Thank you for joining. I pray that you have learned something tonight. That God has spoken to your heart to encourage you to keep moving forward in the plan he has for your life. And the purpose he called you out of darkness into his light to be a witness for him. Until next week, share this video with somebody else. Whoever God put on your heart to share it with, share this video. And I guarantee in the process, you will be blessed and they'll be blessed too from hearing this word. Until next week, shalom. Peace be unto you.